Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Last session of the day. I'm sure that it has been a long day, with a lot of sessions, and thank you very much. So first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Ricardo, but everyone's called me Rido. I'm from Spain, but I'm working in Redmond in Microsoft, in a big team that we are doing a lot of things related to JavaScript. So not only C Sharp, there are more languages here, and this is why I'm in Microsoft. So things that we are doing, probably you know, we are working on Chakra. It's the open source engine for JavaScript that drives Edge, and we announced um, an integration with Node recently. We also have another team running TypeScript. That it's uh, an open source language. I don't know if you are familiar with TypeScript. Yes? No? Yeah? We'll talk a little bit about it. We also have um, another team that are Apache Cordova committers. We are going to talk a lot about Cordova today. But I'm working on Visual Studio and JavaScript mobile tooling. So Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. And I'd like to, um, to share with you all the things that I learned talking with a lot of customers and trying to help different people to create apps using JavaScript. So probably you are familiar with, with this sentence from Jeff Atwood, that any app that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. And I think that this sentence says a lot of things, and this has a reason. It's because JavaScript is the most universal language that we have today. We have C-sharp sh with Xamarin, and there are m different options. But JavaScript, it's truly the unique language that you can used to write server code, client code, web apps, mobile apps, and different things. So today, what I'd like to talk about is which is the state of the mobile, mobile development uh, in JavaScript, which are the different options, and why we think that Cordova today is one of the best options that we have. It's fun to say because Cordova is a Spanish word that is not Cordova, it's Cordova. But anyway, everyone says Cordova. <laughs> so and then, which are the different JavaScript tools that we are using, uh, or that, well, that we are creating for you? So, depends on your preferences. You can go with for a full IDE like Visual Studio, or maybe you prefer the command line, or something in the middle like the extensions that we are creating for for VS Code. Uh, another important part of the JavaScript ecosystem is TypeScript. Uh, we are investing a lot of uh, on, on this language, and well, where is the, what is the state of the art today of, of TypeScript, and how can you use it in, in your mobile apps? Especially when we are talking about Angular and Ionic. I don't know if you're familiar with these frameworks. There are a lot of frameworks. I will cover some of those later. But we think that Ionic is a real good one to, to create this kind of, of mobile apps. And finally, um, just a quick in <coughs> introduction about we are what are we doing in the DevOps space and how can you use our tools in Visual Studio Team System, Team Services, sorry, to, to create your builds, deployments, and the different kind of uh, tasks that it's not only development. And the most important thing is the Q&A. I'm more than happy to do talk with any of you. If you want after the session or tomorrow during the conference, uh, I'd love to speak with customers, know, know what's, what kind of features you like, what kind of features you don't like, what are you expecting for the next versions of the product. We are mm, very close to the next version of Visual Studio. Um, I think that we didn't announce the name yet, but will be the next one <laughs> to uh, 2015. And well, let's see if we uh, still have some time to introduce the features that, that you need. So as we said in, as I said before, um, in Visual Studio, that's the organization that, uh, that I work, there are a lot of different technologies to create cross-platform solutions. Talking about mobile is talking about cross-platform. I'm still a Windows Phone user. Sadly, I don't know if <laughs> this <laughs> will be a uh, well, a platform <laughs> in the future, but it brings some devices, Android, iOS, and everyone wants to to create apps for this. But we also have Windows, and if you can write once for all these platforms, and well, we have like 300 million devices running Windows, so I think it's a platform that we should consider as well, not only iOS and Android. And <coughs> with Cordova, you you can get benefits for for the three platforms. Yes. 
with, with the same code. So we have mm, the native technologies, uh, .NET, Xamarin, Unity, React Native, something that we announced in the last Facebook conference, support for Windows in React Native. Um, we also have mobile technologies, ASP.NET, the responsive web, familiar for a lot of people for too many years, and we also have the hybrid applications, where uh, Apache Cordova belongs to that kind of apps. And the languages that we use are JavaScript, TypeScript, Transpilot to JavaScript, and frameworks like Angular or, or Ionic. But today we are going to focus on, on Cordova. But before getting to the more details into what is Cordova and how it works, let me try to recap where we are in the mobile JavaScript development life landscape. So we want to create apps for Windows, for Android, and for iOS. And from the beginning, we also have HTML5. HTML5 uh, was a big promise that we could use a lot of features, a lot of specs, a lot of standards, but today is not a reality. You can have mobile websites that are responsive, works great on your devices, but have two, bigger, two big problems. The first one is that they require to be online. Well, everyone is online every time, but there are some kind of apps that are that should be able to run without an internet connection, or a, at least a good internet connection. And the other problem is the, mm, the how to access device native device capabilities. So if you want to create an app, you want to create your, you want to access the geolocation. OK, you can access the geolocation with the browser, but maybe the camera. Oh, yes, it's also the camera in the HTML5, but not the barcode the scanner, or what's happening when you want to access the more device-specific capabilities, like the accelerometer, or barcode code scanner, or uh, name it. So what we have is also another perception from, from this is the performance problem. We know that in native, we will be more performance than in web. But at the same time, uh, the productivity is also greater in you, if you go to the, to the webs, to, to that side. And when I say productivity, I mean that if you want need to create the same app three times, this is going to be costly. <laughs> no one wants to create the same app three times. Also, another factor that is important talking about productivity is to ch which tools do you want to use. So if you want to go to Android, you need to write your code in Java or C++. If you want to go uh, iOS, then you need to <coughs> write your code in Swift or Objective-C. And for all of the web developers, if we are web developers, we like to choose our tools. So we are, are not trying to convince anyone saying, this is the tool to create this app. So maybe you are happy with your browser, your dev tools, or you want to use Sublime, or you want to use your text editor, or Vim, or Visual Studio. Who cares? But this will um, affect your productivity, that the freedom to choose the tool where you feel more productive. It's true that we have things like React Native, React Native allows us to create native apps using JavaScript, or React Native, and native scripts, native script. But these technologies, these frameworks are pretty new, and, and they don't have all the support. Maybe in two or three years from now, React Native will be a good solution. But today, it's too new. <laughs> It's just to be on the bleeding edge. And sometimes if you are working for a customer or you want to create apps for your company, you don't want to experiment with these new things. In the other hand, in the last two or three months, everyone is talking about progressive web apps, the great promise from Google. We have um, progressive web apps that will allow you to have offline access with service workers. You could have notifications. You could have. But the reality is, again, it's a new technology. It's only working in Chrome. It's not cross-platform. Could be good in some years from now. But today, the best op option that we have is Cordova. That's how we think that for enterprises, when you want to create software and apps for companies, maybe it's not for to publish in the store, but for companies, it's a real good, good option. Because it's right in the middle of the performance and the productivity. So you will get more performance than in a typical web applications because you can have access to the device capabilities. Mm, there is a solid and mature community 
of people creating plugins. So we have more than 1,000 plugins to do a lot of different, different things with, with your devices. And at the same time, it's not tied to any company or tool. So we have companies like IBM working in Cordoba, Salesforce, Adobe, um, Microsoft. So it's not just uh, one, one company. And there are a lot of tools to, to work with this. But again, you will need something else, not just Cordoba, because you are going to see right now that Cordoba is just the basic infra infrastructure to, to make this possible. But you need something else to create your apps. And there are a lot of frameworks in the web. And some of them are really specialized for, for this kind of development, like Angular and, and Ionic. But if you want to choose other framework, it's fine. Even you can use React.js in Cordoba apps not React Native, React yeah, yes. We are running some experiments to enable some kind of native capabilities inside Cordoba apps, but again, it's more an experiment, something new that we are um, testing if, if it really works or not. So um, focusing on Cordoba, which are the best benefits that we found? The first is the um, lower cost of ownership. So if you truly can share your business logic and your UI layers and really sharing the 100% of your code, um, you could mm, <coughs> yeah, lower the cost of ownership and, and get to the market faster. And you can create apps that are really, really similar to native apps. Maybe there are some effects, transitions, things that are specific for one platform that you can't get those, but for an overall, for the average app, I think that with Cordova we can have a real good good performance. And this is why we call hybrid. And hybrid is something that is in the middle of two worlds, like the iguana. So these kind of animals, they are good on the water and good on the earth. They can survive in two different ambients. So you need to, you can think in, in hybrid in the same way. Because hybrid means that there is some part that is native, but also sometimes that is web. The good thing here is that the problems with native um, are abstracted from you. So you are going to see, when I show you how Cordoba works, that you don't need to know Objective-C or Java or C Sharp to access the uh, device capabilities. It's on the plugin. And the plugin will expose some JavaScript APIs that allows you to access these capabilities without special knowledge of the native code. So before, who knows who is Cordova? Everyone who use it? Yes, 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 yes. Just to know how much time you want to uh, spend here. So I can go very fast. So Cordova, just uh, in the short description, is just a web view that renders your uh, UI in, in the DOM, but have access projections to the device capabilities using plugins. Each plugin uh, exposes a, a JavaScript API. So you write once in JavaScript, and all the calls will be translated to the, um, to the native layer. So you can think in Cordova something like this. You create your Cordova project, and then you will have one part of the code that there are is your code, your HTML, your JavaScript, your CSS, the configuration, your splash screens, icons, and so on. And other part that you don't see, but it's still there, that is the platform code and the plugins code. In fact, you need to build three times, one for each platform. So what Cordova is doing, you can think in Cordova like, like a code generator, where you are um, generating the code for each platform based from just one si single source. So mm, this is why we <laughs> you need a, a Mac if you want to build for iOS, and you need a Windows if you need to build for Windows. But it's a code generator. <coughs> And from this, you will generate your your project. Um, so let me do a quick demo about what is Cordova. And I want to show you not only Cordova, but also what is the VS Code extension for Cordova. Have you tried that extension? Any in the room? No? Good. So 
let's do our first step. Oops. Like this. So Cordova is a command line that, that runs on Node. Right now we are on version 6.2, I guess. And to create an app, I can do Cordova, create, and you see app. And I'm going to give a name, yes, Cordova.app. This is important because it will generate the um, config XML for the provision profile that I have already have provisioned in this device to be able to, to create here. So this will create a basic Cordova project. And what's I what is in it? Is it oops, NDC app. Let's clear a little bit. So you have a config XML that is like the manifest of your app. Here is where you define your um, your content, um, some policies, and your icons, and so on. And then you, we have hooks. Hooks is just a mechanism to customize how the plugins will work. Platforms is where you specify which platforms do you want to support. You can choose. You can choose just one platform, three platforms. In fact, Cordova, the open source project, uh, supports more than eight platforms, including WebOS, Firefox, Amazon. But in Microsoft, we are focusing just on the big three, Windows, well, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, um, iOS, and, and Android. Then you have your plugins, is where the native code <laughs> is living. And finally, the dab, dab, dab folder. This folder, dab, 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 is like the root of your web server. It's where you put all your um, web assets. So the first thing that we can do is to add a platform for iOS. Doop, 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 doop. OK, and now I should be able to run. So to do so, I have here this cool trick that this is my device, a real device, and I'm going to deploy here. Cordova run iOS, last device, and the app that I just created is here. So what is happening here is that Cordova is creating the Xcode project <laughs> with native code, and is building the whole thing invoking uh, Xcode. But you don't need to see that. So I'm, show you, I'm show you <laughs> showing this just for to, to explain what is it, but but you don't need to, to understand what is happening. If we open this uh, with code, you will see what's happening here. So here in the platforms, iOS, this is the platform that I generate. And here in classes, you will see that there are some code that, to be honest, I don't understand. So, But I know that it's here, right? <laughs> So here is where the native code lives, but you don't need to, s to see this never. OK, so here is my app, basic HTML. And the canonical example here is just to access the camera, for example. So to access the camera, let's say that we want to add a click event handler here and then show the image, the picture that I'm going to take. So I will add an image, give it an ID. It's going to be the photo and some style with like this. OK. And now let's add some JavaScript to access the camera. So I have this element. Uh, I'm going to add event listener that will be click. And on click, what I want is to call this take picture. And let's create that function. Uh, this will be take picture. This will be a function that. This is what we are going to do. Most of the plugins are exposed in their API in the navigator um, object. Well, and here is where 
I'm going to show you the tools that we are building to have a better experience. Now, I know the code, it's in my head, I memorized the signature and everything, but I'm going to show you which tools are we doing to improve the, this experience. So, this will be something like camera, get picture, and in the get picture there are two callbacks. The first one is the success callback that will return some data. And the second one is the error callback uh, that will return some error. Okay. And finally, there are some options that I never remember. So what I want to do here with the data is just do the var l image will be my document get element by ID. Of course, you can use here any framework that you want. So you want to use jQuery or Backbone or Knockout, you can do it. I'm just doing this demo for simplicity. I think that the ID was photo, and I want to make the I source to the data. Right? So that's it. Uh, OK. So the only thing that is missing is that I need to add the plugin to the project, the camera plugin. So one thing about Cordova is that the plugins is like the references that you add to your c -sharp project. So you choose which native capabilities you want. So to do so, let me go back to the console. Cordova plugin, I can list. I have only one plugin, it's the whitelist. This is something about security to control which URLs you can call from your app. But I'm going to add a plugin called Cordova Plugin Camera. The plugins are stored in NPM, so you can search for plugins, and most of them are start with Cordova dash plugin, but it's not really required. So now, if I run a Cordova Prepare iOS, this is not going to build, this is just going to generate the code that will be built afterwards. So now, if we look at the platforms, iOS, here, we will have more classes that access the camera here. So here's the plugin. But again, you don't need to look at this. It's so ugly. So sorry. Trust me, it's here. And now let's run the app. Cordova run iOS device. And that's it. And let's see if it works the first time. Uh, let me show you. This is the previous version of the app. Uninstall. Install again. Running. Now I click here. This is the camera. Uh, picture. Use this photo. And the photo is here. OK, so this is a simple demo. Uh, I think that you get an idea about what Cordova is. Any questions from now? Good? Yes? Great. <laughs> So what we did in, in, in code to make this experience a little bit better. So we have one extension that you can get from the store. Um, well, I already installed this extension from the store, not from the ga uh, gallery or VS Code extension gallery. And I have the Cordova tools. The extension that I have is not the one that is released. I built this one here before, but you can do the same. This is open source in GitHub. Go to VS Code Cordova, uh, pull, clone the repo, build, and you can drag and drop the V6, and you will have the latest versions of, of the tools. And we are doing uh, three things here. First thing is to add some commands to the palette. So you can do Cordova build, so you can do the build here. The same thing that I did from the command line, you can do from here. Well, the second thing that we add is that we are detecting which plugins are you using, and we are adding typings. You are going to say, oh, but these typings work from TypeScript, right? Yes, this is the .d.ts syntax to define which is the API that you want to use. But VS Code is able to consume these typings for your JavaScript. So you don't need to use TypeScript if you don't want. So now, if I need to write the same code again. First, when I say dot, I should have the camera here. And in the get picture, I should have the get picture with the parameters.
parameters. And for example, here I told you that there were some options that I never remember. The option here is camera options. This is the type. So the experience will be much as any static language. So here I could say destination type equals camera destination type dot, and I have here my enum. Or things like the quality of the photo, and I will say. So we are doing the common palette integration. We are doing the IntelliSense. And also we are doing something that is really cool, That is that we allow debugging your app from here. So you can set breakpoints, like here and there. Choose th your debugger for Cordova and run on iOS device. And from here, no command line. And it should be the same thing as we did before, but with debugging and IntelliSense and common palette integration. This is the basic thing of this extension. This is what is released. And later, I will guide you about more things that we are doing. So right now, let's see if the breakpoints are there. Whoops. Here we go. And you can debug, and you can have your watches and, and everything. So let me take another photo. Whoops. And we will see the callback here with your call stack, your watches. I could say, what's that? I and I can see everything. OK, any of you have used VS Code for debugging before? No? Well, I think that it's a nice feature that, that we have. So this is cross-platform, running in the Mac, everything good. OK, so this is the extension. So let's, talk, let's go back to the presentation. We were here. the time. OK, so we all know that we want JavaScript, but what's happened with JavaScript? The, the big problem with JavaScript is what we call the feature gap. This slide is not mine. It's from Anders Helsberg, the inventor of TypeScript and C Sharp. And he defined the feature gap like a problem that we have when a dyna dynamic language like JavaScript, where the standards are evolving, but the implementation is not so fast. So for example, one year from now, um, in 2015, we were very close to hit the ES2015 standard. But the server were a little bit behind in the ES5, and the browsers even behind. So what's happened is that we want to use the latest features, but for what <laughs> if no one is able to consume that features? Things like classes, or LED, or that kind of things. And this is what we call the, the feature gap, where we want to have productivity, and, but we also need to target to specific devices. So one year ago, some people said, OK, it's cool to have TypeScript, but there will be some point where all the browsers and Node.js and everyone will hit ES2015. So why I care about TypeScript? What's happened is that in a year from now, the standards already evolve. <laughs> and the browsers and Node, but there is a still a feature gap. So if you are running TypeScript, you will be able to run on the bleeding edge of the language and at the same time target all the browsers that you, that you want. In fact, today, you can use TypeScript 1.8 and target ES3, so running in real all devices. And that's really important. When if, if you are planning to, tar to target devices like real Androids, all Androids, Sometimes they are not supporting all the JavaScript features. So TypeScript, you know, it's just a superset of JavaScript. So any JavaScript program is a TypeScript program, but you can add things. And the first thing are types. And when you have types, you have that experience. You have better tooling. You can do things like IntelliSense. You can do things like go to definition. You can go do things like refactorings, renames. And that's really, it, this will increase your productivity. And well, if I started with typed language like C Sharp, and to be honest, I prefer the compiler tell me if I made a mistake running that waiting until I'm running the application. So everything that I can get from the compiler, better. And the good thing is that it's up to you how much TypeScript you want to use or not. We are very close to TypeScript 2.0 that will be released soon for sure with the next version of, of Visual Studio, but you can use TypeScript uh, uh, where you want. 
it's not tied to Visual Studio. So we have one version of TypeScript for VS, another version of TypeScript that is an NPN module. So you can run it in Linux, Mac, and Windows, where you want. And it's up to you how much TypeScript you want. So you can choose how many types you want to add. So what I we are seeing is a lot of people that have some code in JavaScript, and they are moving progressively. You don't need to do everything TypeScript, so you can mix things together. In fact, one of the cool features that is coming on the next version of Visual Studio is the JavaScript language service that we call Salsa, that will allow you to mix uh, JavaScript and TypeScript in the same projects really easily, to have the same experience with IntelliSense and so but this will allow you to choose which parts of your programs wants to try to move to, to TypeScript. But it's not only the language. <laughs> the other problem is the framework. So last year, we did a survey to more than 800 Cordova developers asking to which tooling, frameworks, tools they were using. And we created this Stack Cloud. So there are a lot of options, there a lot. It's not easy to choose your, your framework. In one hand, you want to use a framework because you don't want to write code from scratch, everything. So here in the demo, it's nice to use get element by ID. But when you <laughs> write get element by ID 100 times every day, probably you need something else. But if you go to jQuery, it's <laughs> I don't know if it really solves all the problems. You can use knockout for the binding, but what's happened with the routing? And so at the end, you need to make a decision. And when you choose one of these frameworks, for sure you are not going to use 100% of this framework. You are going to use 10%, 20%. And this could affect your, your performance. So again, it's a trade-off between performance and productivity. What we think is that with Angular 2, that is in release candidate right now, it's from Google, but we will have a good trade-off between performance and productivity. At the end, I will show you how it looks like to create an app with Angular 2 and, and Ionic 2. And it's not only the framework, it's also the tooling. And this is what m creates more headaches for <laughs> a lot of, of users, because you don't want to spend time here. Uh, NPM, it's huge, just to understand all the different options that you have to install your packages. So what we did with Cordova plugins that are NPM, but you don't know, I think that it's a good approach. You have a gulp grant to create your tasks. You have SAS to have better CSS. You have TypeScript, but you need to transpile the TypeScript in something else. And it's not only transpiling. The problem with, well, the problem, the challenge with TypeScript or even ES6 is that you have that thing called modules, where you can re define the dependencies of your components from code. Remember when you decide to add one new JavaScript library to your web page. Uh, oh, remember, I need to go to all my HTML and add this uh, script tag. Oh, no, but I have my master page, so I only add in one place. But what happens with the order? So you need to take care of the order and everything. With modules, everything, that the problem is gone. But now you have a different problem. Is that the what's happened with the module? How are you going to reference the modules? Do you want to hit like 200 or 300 files at this Angular, or you want to create a bundle? So you want to create a bundle, maybe you want to use Webpack or System.js or a lo loader. So there are a lot of options. And one of the things that it's my advice and the best practice is that when you choose your framework, look very carefully at the tooling that it's based on. Because maybe you can choose a framework that does not have a solid tooling and could slow down your development. So it's important the framework, but also the tooling that is behind it. And this is why we created the um, what we talk, we call TACO, Visual Studio Tools for Apache Cordova, that are a set of utilities on top of Visual Studio that will help you to create this kind of program. So now I need to switch to Windows. That is here running in my parallels, so it's not very fast. Oops. And here I have Visual Studio um, with Cordova. So what we have here is a typical project Visual Studio project. Um, this is Ionic 1 using Angular 1, but with TypeScript. So Ionic 1, by default, is using JavaScript, not TypeScript. But we created this template and will allow you to use TypeScript with JavaScript. But you will see that it's not the 
full feature TypeScript. It's just a migration from JavaScript to TypeScript. So things that, that we have here, first thing that you will notice is these dependencies. So here we support NPM and Bower. NPM to declare your the dependencies that you have. The, those are defined on this package.json. This is the standard NPM way to define dependencies. And here, for example, we depend on Gulp and Bower. Bower, it's another package manager. To be honest, it's not very popular these days, but Ionic want to use it, so we support it anyway. So we are seeing that most of the, <laughs> of the frameworks and developers are just putting everything on NPM. So NPM is eating all the different package managers. But anyway, we support both. And we also have um, support for, for Bower, because Ionic is in Bower. One important thing about NPM is that there were a change before NPM3 and after NPM3 that are really, really different. So uh, before NPM3, all the dependencies were created in a deep hierarchy that most often that we like, we hit the max path issue in Windows of 256 characters that has been solved in the latest version of Windows. If you don't know, the version that is coming this summer has the option to enable long paths. But anyway, after NPM3, um, the hierarchy is a flat hierarchy. So we don't have this problem anymore. And this is important because depending on which version of Node and NPM you are using, you could have problems or not. Well, anyway, I'm running here mm, the release candidate two of the web tools because some part of these of these tools are not only for Cordova projects, are also shared with ASP.NET Core projects. For example, NPM, it's the, the, the same tool. And also we have our Gulp file. And our Gulp file is where we define the different tasks that we have. Here in Ionic 1, it's a real simple one. We only use two tasks. One is to compile the SAS and other one is to compile the the other one is to compile the TypeScript. That should be here. So here instead of using the command line compiler of TypeScript, I'm using the, the this Gulp task that also is creating source maps. Source maps is an important part of your TypeScript workflow because will allow you to debug the TypeScript even if the code that is running is the JavaScript. But your experience will be like C Sharp. And we also have here another tool that it's a little bit hidden. It's called the Task Runner Explorer. And this tool is able to parse your um, Gulp file and allow you to execute tasks from here. So if I run this, what will happen is that it will take the TypeScript code that I have here and will transpile the code to JavaScript that you can see here in dab, 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 JS. And here I have my JavaScript and my maps. This is what is deployed to the, to the device. Um, the other thing that we added to Visual Studio is this um, one editor for this manifest, for the config XML. And here you can define some common properties for your manifest, like versions, um, your ID, your names, <laughs> descriptions. The version of Cordova that you are using, remember that in the command line I was using the latest, that is 6.2.0, but I can choose which version of, of Cordova we want to, to run or you can use the global install version. We are uh, taking a lot of attention to make sure the interoperability between VS Code and VS. So you can have some people in your team working with Visual Studio and some of them wor working with VS and everything should work. Because we think that not everyone on the team has the same preferences. And this is one of these features that will make easier to, to configure. And one important thing here, the plugins. So we provide a plugin editor. We are constantly updating this, um, this list. Well, not only this list, all the tools. Right now, last, last this week, we released the update 10 of Taco. We are trying to be as more agile as we can and releasing often. Uh, 
and well, one of the things that we are doing is improving this experience. So we are offering here a list of plugins that we care about. So we are reviewing the quality of these plugins. One of the problems with the open source is that you are depending of a lot of plugins from a lot of people, and who knows with the quality is the quality that I need. So the plugins that you will see here are plugins that we tested and that we ensure that will work. Plugins that we have here, for example, ADAL, this is for Active direct Azure di Directory Authentication. Mobile apps, um, this will allow you to have push notifications, uh, access to data, mobile engagement. This is the uh, core plugins of Cordoba, like access the battery, Bluetooth, low energy, camera, capture. So the same thing that I, s that I did before, here will be just add, and this will do the same thing without the command line. It's doing basically the same thing. We also have the ability to add plugins. You can add plugins by ID. So if you find the plugin in NPM or whatever and you don't want to go to the command line, you can add it from here. You can also add plugins from your local folder. This is really helpful if you decide to create your own, your own plugins or even from Git. So you can set the Git URL. And we will grab the plugin for you and, and install. And well, then just show you the, the plugins that, that are installed. And the last thing that I want to show you about Visual Studio, because I don't want to spend too much time here, and um, probably you know Visual Studio or love it or hate it, but well, that's the other cool feature that we have is that we provide the same experience across different platforms. So you can choose your platform. So here I'm in Windows. I'm going to deploy my local machine, and we provide a um, debugging experience that will allow you to use your um, Windows, iOS, Android, emulator, devices, or even browser workflows that we will talk a little bit about browser workflow, what uh, is important in Cordova development from the same integrated environment from Visual Studio. That's something that is unique from this tool. And the debugging, I'm not talking all only about TypeScript debugging. We are also talking about DOM Explorer. So here, well, this is the Windows version. Oop. We have a problem here. Well, anyway, this <laughs> is just to show you the, the debugging that, that we have here. And we have a DOM Explorer, where it's like the dev tools, where you can navigate for the different nodes and see and, and change things. So the only thing is that if you want to build and debug for iOS, you can't do it in your box. So you need something. You need to communicate to your um, Mac machine. So what we have is a tool called Remote Build. What is it here? Again, this is another NPM package. I'm going to configure without security to avoid but you can configure with certificates and so on. And this is like a web server that is listening to Visual Studio. So when I go to iOS and I say that I want this time, I want to use the simulator, not the device, I can run this and my VS will communicate with that command line tool and will allow to build, deploy, attach, and debug. And we have different options here because sometimes it's not mm, well, it's not natural that you have two machines and you are deploying in one machine and debugging in the other. So we also have the ability to have local iOS deployments. What it means is that you can have one Mac Mini or even Mac in Cloud somewhere, request the build, grab the IPA, that is the output file, and deploy to your to the, your iOS device that is attached to your Windows machine. So you don't need to have a Mac in your office. You can use a remote build to, to do this. So right now, we are submitting. Here, you will see that we started a new build. That is this new one. But it takes some time. So well, it's something that we enable. But probably you will understand <laughs> that you, we need something with more speed. So w what I'm doing here is good for demos, but it's not, it's not good for working every day. So we cannot make a change to a file and wait like three minutes until I can see something in my simulator, right? 
And because Cordova is for web developers, we know that web developers have different expectations. So they want to have speed. So I want to make a change, and I want to see that change fast. I want to edit a CSS file, I want to edit my HTML, my JavaScript, and I want to, m to see the change really fast, because this is how things work today in the web. So we have that concept of live reload, that even I don't want to press F5 every time I make a change. I want to make a change, and that's it. And I want to see the change. And also, this ch every time that I make a change to a TypeScript, I need to spin up all my tooling. So I need to create my, my TypeScript build. I want to create my bundle, uh, my SAS, everything. And I want to do it just every time I, I save a file. So here in BS, we are, well, let's see if the build ends. Uh, and then I can show you the browser workflow. Oh, an error. The hook. Well, trust me, I, mean, I don't want to spend more time here, but it works. <laughs> um, so for, well, let's remove the hook because I'm not using it. It's because there are different versions of, Cordo of Cordova that I'm, that I'm running. Um, so in Visual Studio, what we have is a tool called Ripple. Ripple, it's a web emulator where you can um, use Chrome and a little web server to emulate your, emulate your device. So here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run this watch task in my Task Runner Explorer. So every time I change something in my, type, my, my TypeScript, this will pick up the change and, and execute the, the, the task that is affected. So right now I'm watching for CS SAS changes and TypeScript changes, and I'm going to deploy in Ripple. And this is much faster, because I don't need to run the native part. Remember when we started talking about Cordova that we are making real builds. H this is not a real build. This is just putting things on the dub 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 folder and showing, showing that things. So this is Ripple. This is another open source project. Again, I can debug, I can attach. Whoops. Wait. OK. And here I have my app. I can do things like in any DOM Explorer. So for example, let's say that I want to select this, the playlist. And I want to say music. Cool. And it's here, change it, real time. But this, is, this change didn't trigger from my code. So what I want is to, let's see if I can do things little bit smaller. Ah. Like this, OK. Let's open the controller, <coughs> run it again, this time without debugging, just to make it faster. And I want to make some changes here in my, in my code. So for example, here in the list. Well, let's see. This is running. Yes. Now let's see that it changed. And who likes chill? I like Brock. So that with one hand, save. Uh, and it's changing. I don't want to change. It should change without any. Oops, but here we go. But this is too slow. <laughs> this is too slow. We know that we make the, this live reload, so we are working to improve this experience right now. And what we have is something in VS Code that is much lighter. So in Visual Studio, mm, well, there are some technical problems right now in this version of VS, but the next version and the tools for Apache Cordova, this experience will be much better. But anyway, you didn't need to hit refresh, run, and everything. So everything is, is automated. So, time happened so fast. I only have 10 more minutes and a couple of things to cover. So, one thing is the live reload. So, for live reload, I have here um, the same app that it's Ionic, where I am. This is the same app. I'm going to open the app in VS Code. Let me close this instance. Uh, 
And that's another feature that we added recently to the extension, that is the in integration with Ionic Surf. So here I'm going to surf to the browser from, from VS, and I'm going to do the same thing, and you will see that it's much faster. So this is more or less the same as Ripple, but using an Ionic tool that is called Ionic Surf. Uh, well, we have a bug here that didn't show up with the so it's here. Let's do exactly the same change, and you will see the. Come on, come on. Okay. Let's see if you can see it. Like this. Rock. Save. No. Uh, now save, and this is the speed that we want. Something like this. So again, this is TypeScript that has been compiled and, and everything. Um, but what's in the future? The future is not Ionic 1 or Angular 1, it's Ionic 2. So Ionic 2, it's a great framework. It's based on Angular 2. This allows us to create some kind of HTML components where you define your own tags that will embed all behavior, styles, and everything. It's really easy to compose applications with this. It's based on TypeScript, so the TypeScript experience is much better because when you write a program in TypeScript, the types are defined at the same time. It's different when you use the library from one. For example, you use moment.js, and then someone else create the typings. There could be some a mismatch between the versions of the library and the typings. If the library is written, written in TypeScript, the versions will always match. Ionic also provides a cool way to provide access to plugins that they call it Ionic Native. And now uh, you are going to see. And the most important value proposition from Ionic is that they allow you to define w the interface once, and the interface, the UI, will adapt for each device. So for example, the tab bar will be in the top of the bottom. If it's Android or it's uh, iOS, they will use material design, and you don't need to worry about this. This is because they have a b uh, advanced theming um, scenario. So let's, well, before Taking a look to mm, this slide. Before running the code, let me explain a little bit of how um, Ionic 2 app or Angular app, app looks like. So here, this is a modern TypeScript that we want to, to write. So the first thing that you will notice is the imports. This is like the um, using. This is how you define your dependencies. This could be from an external system like Angular here. Or it could be your own component. So if it starts with dot, it's because it's your code. And it's, if it's not starting with dot, the compiler will go to the node modules folder of npm to, to get this, this typing. We also have attributes, like, well, really they are called decorators, like that add app that will specify behavior. This is the aspect of the programming. We have this in Java and in CSR for a long time. We have classes. We also have decorators. We have types. Um, you don't need to write function anymore. So just a, a method like initialize app is a function. Or here, this platform ready, this is the, the event that Cordova is saying the plugins are ready to, to use them. Lambda expressions, promises, just in, in this code you will see uh, the future. And this will be the markup. So the first thing is that you will notice the new tags like ion content or ion list that will define behavior. And you can mix the ionic tags with your own tags like button, that it's a typical button. We also have some attributes. This ng4, this is the angular syntax to create a repeater. So this will create different buttons. Where, which from let p of pages. This click is the way you have bidirectional data binding. So you can respond to events, and this open page is just a method on that class. There is no more magic, nothing to bind things. And finally, uh, with these double squirrely braces, it's how you define the binding. So if you mix all of this, the app that you will have will be something like this. Let me open. That will be this one. This is the same app, but written in I with Ionic 2. 
So most of the of your app will live on on the app folder, and you will have a TypeScript file and an HTML file five. So for example, here and and the SAS file. And the good thing about this is that uh, Angular is able to compose all, all of the parts and all the components and all the, C all the CSS and all the TypeScript. But the, co the code looks really, really natural. So here, um, just to finish my demos, I'm going to write the same thing that I did at the beginning, just to use the... But because I have only five minutes, I, I would like to, to show it, but I have here in another branch. So... This will looks like this. So what I did was adding just one button, saying that on click I want to take a picture, and instead of doing that document get element by ID, I don't need the ID anymore, and what I can is to bind to some property. So the communication between the HTML and the TypeScript is just the method and the property, property that I'm using to bind. Well, I don't need this. So here, what we have is that I create this property. And here, I have a camera. This is from import camera. You will see that all the different native cap capabilities that you have. The get picture, quality, everything. But instead of using the callbacks, this will use a promise. I assign this value here, and that's it. it this is all, all that I need. And the latest thing that, that we add for this is that, OK, but if I want to use the native capabilities, I cannot use the browser wor workflow that I show you, because the browser workflow runs in the browser. So what's happened with the native capabilities? And this is the latest thing that we are adding to this extension. It's what we call Cordova Simulate. So here we add a couple of options, or these options, that what they will intercept all the calls to the native code and provide a UI where you can specify which values do you want to this. Well, let's see if this works anyway. So every time that you are writing native code, you have a way to mock in that call. So now, here it's channel not fired, something's wrong. Let me. Well, this is the UI where you can simulate the different plugins and events. So you can simulate where, is, where you are in the map, or how is the battery, or how is the accelerometer, or instead of the camera saying, just return this picture, and that's it. And let's see, because I think that I need to run the, the group task. So now VS Code showing me uh, my group file. I'm going to run the tasks. It will take some time. Let's see if I have something here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if I have the platform, and this will finish my demo. Yes. Well, so it's not working. Anyway, you have the idea. This is just, this has not been released. This is the source code that we are working on right now. But I expect to release it very, very soon. But the idea, you get the idea, that we are working on a browser workflow where we can capture all the native calls so you will have the best of both worlds when you are developing. But this didn't mean that you need to to do everything on the browser. So sometimes you need to, to build for the device. And for that, what makes um, it easier is if you have a good integration with um, with some tools like oops, our cloud. So in Visual Studio Team Services, we have build tasks for CI, CD build. So it's really easy to create automatic deployments. So you can. Start with your Cordova app, uh, create an automatic uh, continuous integration build for it. You can uh, integrate with Hockey app, that it's a product that we have for beta distribution. So every time someone makes a change, it will make the native compilation, uh, submit to a private store where your testers could download the app and test it very easily. 
And finally, the latest product that we have, the latest service, is one called Code Push. That this will allow you to send updates to your app, even if the app has been downloaded from the store. Because this is HTML, right? So you don't need to build everything. So if you are not adding more plugins or you are not doing that kind of things, you are not changing the native capabilities, you can send updates even without using the store. There are more, um, well, we, we could talk just another session on only with that. So in sum summary, just for ending, uh, we have the web. The web is a good platform and you can use all the technologi technologies that you, that you know and you love to create your apps. You can choose your JavaScript framework, framework uh, that you want. With TypeScript, you can increase your productivity. You need to select your target devices. It's not the same target all Android devices that modern ones, or iOS, or Windows. So it's important to target the devices. Use modern tools as VS Code or Visual Studio, and use the cloud and Visual Studio team system to deploy frequently, and make sure that your app really enjoy your users. So here I have some URLs, but they're really easy to find. So cordova.io, taco.visualstudio.com is where we are hosting all our documentation. A couple of important repos. The VS Code Cordova is the extension that I showed you for VS Code that is open source. And the Cordova Simulate that this is the latest project that we are working on. And I think that that's it, just in time. Any questions or comments? Nope. Thank you very much.